Hi, I'm Pastor John Decker from Morningstar Baptist Church, and I just want to say thank you for watching today. And I hope that the worship and the message today is, is encouraging to you. And we love to stay connected with you through this crazy time of the coronavirus. And part of that is we still want to be praying for you. And every Sunday, normally when we meet, uh, we have people fill out connection cards and put their prayer requests on there. And we still want to keep praying for you. We want to know, is there a need you're going through? How can we help you? Maybe there's something that you need some help with, and we'd love to come and be able to meet that need for you. So at the bottom of the screen right now is uh, my email address, pastor at morningstardayton. Dot org, and you can email me directly. That comes straight to me, and, and we'll want to pray for you, but also we'll be able to meet some needs if you got something we can help you with. Uh, please let us know. And maybe by the end of the message today, maybe God, maybe he's working in your life. I, who knows about what? Maybe you give your life to Jesus Christ today, or maybe you're like, man, I, there's something that I need to take care of. Then we would love to be able to connect with you on that. And so there's an email address at the bottom right now called response at morningstardayton.org. And I'd love to follow up with you on that and just, man, help you celebrate whatever God's doing in your life. So, man, thanks again for watching, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Hey, Morning Star Baptist Church, we are here live with you today and we are pumped as usual. You know why? Because we are in the best place, whether that's at your house or in a basement or some, somewhere random, we are here to worship God today. Hey, just a couple quick announcements for you. Make sure to keep sharing all of our Facebook posts. We have an awesome opportunity to share the gospel to so many people if they can see this. So make sure that you like comment and share everything that we put out and also if you need to get in touch with us in any way possible reach out we are here to talk to you guys we want to communicate with you we are trying our best to do everything possible to reach you in this time hey listen john has an amazing message for you today everyone get ready get your thinking caps on because john is bringing the word let's get excited god is good this morning so it's that time, it's that time to worship. So let's get loud, let's get excited. Listen, your neighbors might hear you down the street. Your kids upstairs might be really confused, but that's okay because we are excited to worship God this morning. So let's get ready. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you. So excited to worship with you this morning. We wanna invite you to sing. You might be in your house, it might be weird, but sing with your family and lift your voice, church, lift your voice. clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. And fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the 
sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. The Bible says that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Sing, who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 No one can, church. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Bow before the lion and the lamb. Good morning and welcome back uh, to Morningstar Baptist Church Online. And this is week two of our little uh, experiment here that we're <laughs> trying to figure out what the new normal is. And I know you're trying to do the same thing, but we're glad that you're watching and so thankful for everybody who watched last week and shared and commented on and liked uh, the, the link uh, to our YouTube video. And we just, man, this is, this is definitely different times, uh, but we're, we're excited to be able to have the technology to do this and keep doing this. And I, and I know uh, Ben and his team have worked really hard with the worship and still providing this opportunity for us to sing and to praise God. And uh, this week, the same thing as last week, like when it comes to our giving, there's really no difference. And the work of God doesn't stop. Our missionaries don't stop. And in fact, I've heard reports uh, this past week of some of our missionaries that are down in Central America and how they're, look, they, they're still feeding people and they're still reaching out and they're still meeting needs. And they're still, man, people down there, they're, they're asking questions and God's still moving. And so we need to make sure we're still faithful and, and supporting them and really what God has for us right here. And so today, this morning, we even have a chance again to be able to give back to God and worship Him in our giving. And we're going to have the link right now. You can see the link down there where you can go to our Facebook page. Uh, you can go to our website and you can click the give now or you can go, you can text in the number on the bottom of, of the screen and you can text in your giving as well because we just want to make sure we give every opportunity for us to stay connected and at even comes to our giving. And so thank you to everybody who was faithful last week and was able to, to, to be a part of this. And we're looking forward to what God's going to do. We know that he's still in control and see he still has this. And, and this has been, even though it's been different, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I know we saw some house churches that are meeting and watching this this morning and a lot from watching it from your own home. And, and we're glad that you're, you're watching. We're glad that you're staying connected. And so let's pray this morning. We're excited about what God's going to do the rest of this morning. And uh, let's just give it all to him. And let's just see and watch what he does even today. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the time this morning that we're able to worship you, whether we're at home with our family or we're at a house church uh, with, with some of our church uh, family. God, we're just so thankful that we can do this. And God, how humbling it is that just because things are different, you're still moving and you're still in control and you still have a plan and a job for us to do. And so, God, thank you for the worship time this morning and for uh, the, the chance to sing to you and, and praise your name. And even for now, in the giving, God, we pray that you're glorified in all of it, that we'll all be faithful to continue to push forward your work of what you're doing right here in Centerville, Ohio, but also around the world. And we can't wait to hear 
when this is all over, God, what it is uh, that you've done, both here and also around the world. We're, we're so excited to find out on the backside uh, how you're still moving and what you're up to. God, thank you for this moment this morning. God, work through the preaching of your word here in just a moment. Uh, that, God, you'll just change all of us, challenge us, and uh, that we'll be looking. Our eyes will be opened and always willing to step out in faith for whatever it is you have for us. God, and we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. In every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants Cause I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord. I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord. I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Psalm 115, it says this, not to us, Lord, not to us, but your glory to your name. Give glory to your name because you are faithful. Because of your faithful love, because of your truth, why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. See, their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. They cannot make sound with their throats. Those who are, those who make them are just like them, as are those who trust in them, if all those other idols. But Israel, or maybe this morning Morningstar, trust in the Lord. He is our help and shield. House of Aaron, or your house this morning where you sit, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Who fears the Lord and trusts in the Lord, he is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord add to your, your numbers, both yours and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the human race. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, nor those who are descending into silence of death, but we will bless the Lord, both now and forever. Hallelujah. So no matter where you sit this morning, all the gods, all the things that we've given our lives to, it seems like they've been ripped out of our hands, doesn't it? Maybe God has taken this time for the thing that you have decided to put your so much trust in and so much time in that he's taken it from you. And now you have just a very few things, right? The things God's blessed you with, your family, the roof over your head, the word of God, and a good God who loves us. And I don't know where you find yourself this morning. But I won't let those who are dead be the ones who praise the Lord. And I won't let the ones who are dying be the ones who lift his name. This morning, me and my family will lift his name. 
maybe in our living room by ourselves, but we will lift his name because he is good. Lord, we come before you this morning. We praise you for who you are. We praise you that no matter what we walk through, that you're good, that you're sovereign, and we trust you because you're a way maker. You're a miracle worker. Lord, no matter whether we see it or not, we know you are up to something, and we're excited to see what it is. We trust you this morning. Cannot wait to hear what Pastor John has. Change us because of your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Welcome back to week two of what we're calling crazy time here in, in our country and also around the world. But man, I hope you enjoyed the worship this morning and that you were encouraged and, and challenged even today. And uh, I'm so thankful to everyone who watched last week, who clicked on the link on our Facebook page and watched uh, the, the worship and the message last week. As we talked about prayer over panic and worship over worry and faith over Fear. And I'm especially thankful to everyone who really engaged with it. Those who, man, you, you shared it, you liked it, you commented on it. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that. Um, even this week, today, when this is over and you guys are done, to, to like it, to share it, to comment on it. Because, listen, what, it, it sounds self-serving on the front end. I get that. Hey, like our stuff and share our stuff. But think about it this way. The, last week, the church broke the Internet with the amount of services that were streamed live online, that were posted online. And, I mean, honestly, there were people who watched a service somewhere last week on the Internet who probably have never stepped foot in a church before, who've never heard a sermon or heard the Word of God preached. And think about that for a moment. And so what that means is, is that every time you comment on this post or you share it or you like it, what it does is in the world of social media, that, that pushes it to the top of everybody's news feeds, which means it gets a lot more traction, gets a lot more viewing, and a lot more uh, hits on it. And what that means is more people see it. And you never know who's going to click on it. You never know who follows you or who's a friend of yours on social media who might be struggling right now. Maybe they've been out of church for a while. Maybe they've never really even given their life to Jesus Christ. But they see something that keeps popping up and they click on it because you've shared it or you comment on it. And now they're impacted by it. They're impacted by Jesus. Maybe, maybe they're given new hope. Maybe they give their lives to Christ for the first time. Time. So even in all this craziness, what I love is God has made it even easier for us to get the message out. Have you thought about that? That even in this, 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 this trouble, the trial, the storm, whatever you want to call it, God has actually made it easier for us to get the message out. That literally we can take our finger and push a button and hit share or like or comment and put something on there. And yeah, things are different. Absolutely. And, and things might look different when it's all over. And part of me kind of hopes that it does. Think about this. Everybody in our country has been either affected or impacted by this virus. You've either been affected by it or impacted by it. Here's what I mean by that. There's been thousands of people in our nation who have been affected by it. That either they've, they've gotten sick or their family member has gotten sick or a loved one has even maybe passed away from this virus. There's, there's a few thousand people like that. But then there's millions of people who have been impacted by it. Millions of people who have either lost their job, been laid off, lost all their source of income, their businesses have shut down, they can't travel or go places or even check in on loved ones because of, uh, of uh, politicians and, and leaders who are, making, who are giving out guidelines and, and all these things. And so there's, there's thousands of people who have been affected, but millions of people who have been impacted. And they're all looking for answers. And last week we, we talked about fear and anxiety through everything that's going on right now in our world. And this week I want to take a little bit of a different avenue. I want to take a little bit of a different track through this. And, and today, maybe today you're watching and you're like, man, I'm still, I'm a little fearful. I'm a little panicked by what I'm hearing, whether it's the economic side or the, the health side of this. Let me encourage you to go back and watch last week's message and really tune in of when we talk about how we, are, we can have faith over our fear. But today, I want to give you the main idea. Here's the main idea about today. The main thing. So the whole theme of the talk today is this. In the middle of the trouble, in the middle of the trial, don't miss the opportunities. 
in the middle of the trial, the trouble, the valley, whatever you want to talk about, the giant that we're facing, whatever it is you want to label it as, in the middle of the trouble, in the middle of the trial, don't miss the opportunities. In the middle of this, yeah, it's crazy, it's painful, it can even be fearful, but in the middle of the crazy, the painful, and the fearful, we tend to become inward focused. We tend to kind of uh, look inward and uh, at ourselves and really become self-centered and we lose sight of the big picture. And we actually end up missing some amazing opportunities that God has designed through all of this. Some of you maybe have seen our videos uh, this past week uh, that we call our toilet paper trivia uh, where Ben and Ryan and I go and ambush people in our church with a roll of toilet paper, a gift card, and confetti cannons. And, and it looks silly on the surface. I get that. And some of you probably roll your eyes every time it pops up every day on your screen, on, on your social media. Um, and, we, you know, we run up to somebody's house. We got all this stuff, and we're just being goofy. And, like, you might, like they're just messing around. But honestly, look, everything has a purpose. Everything we do has a reason and a purpose and a meaning behind it. And it's more than just being goofy and funny and crazy, we're going around just trying to bring smiles to people's faces. Especially as we go to our church members every day, we pick a random family to go and surprise. And what we're wanting to do is remind God's children of the joy that lives in us. That as believers, we don't have the spirit of fear. We talked about this last week, but we've given the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind and that our fear doesn't control us because we have Jesus in us and that brings joy. And, and I don't know if you've seen the number of views that Ryan has gotten um, from going around and, and being crazy. I mean, it's in the thousands. These videos are being shared over and over again and it's reaching down to Florida. It's reaching over to Missouri. It's reaching up into the Northwest. It's ever even on the East Coast. It's everywhere. It's spreading like crazy. And if it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen at some point. Someone's going to share that video. One of the videos of us ambushing someone with a roll of toilet paper, and they're going to watch it. And it's going to, at worst, it's going to have them ask, man, what, what's going on with these crazy people? Like, what's different about them? And at best, it's going to have them start digging. Who put that video out? Oh, this place called Morning Star Baptist Church. What are they all about? And maybe they'll click on one of the messages that we have. Maybe they'll click on one of our services and watch and hear Jesus sung about, hear Jesus preached, hear the gospel message presented. And you never know what might happen. Worst case scenario, they look and they say, hey, what's different about these people? How can they laugh and have fun in a time like this? Like, what do they have that I don't have? We don't want to miss the opportunities. I've been very intentional lately when I go to the store and I, I'm interacting with I'm making it very intentional to look people in the eye and smile and talk to them. Now, before you send me hate emails about me not doing social distancing, as well, I'm not invading the personal space. I'm just being very intentional about looking them in the eye and smiling and saying something. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, this is crazy, isn't it? Like, is everything okay? I don't know them, but I'm just trying to start conversations, and I don't know if you've seen this happening uh, lately, but it's been happening for a long time at fast food restaurants, but it's starting to happen a little bit in some grocery stores uh, where somebody would be in line to pay for their stuff, the person in front of them, as they go to hand their card or their money to pay, they, they instead, they, they walk up real quick and they pay for their groceries for them, or they pay for their groceries behind them. Just ways and opportunities to show the love of Christ and to just live out and maybe bring somebody hope and at the same time bringing hope starting a conversation that ends with how God is good and God loves us, right? Opportunities to reach out to neighbors who, man, I don't know if it's like this in your neighborhood, but in our neighborhood, everybody's outside walking on the sidewalks like crazy in droves. Everybody's outside. So maybe the opportunities that we don't want to miss in the middle of this trial and storm is, hey, I don't know these people. I'm going to stop and talk to them as they're walking down the sidewalk. Whatever it takes to seek out people and seek out new ways to introduce people to Jesus. In the middle of the trial, in the middle of the trouble, don't miss the opportunities. This morning we're going to be in 1 Kings. And if you have your Bibles, I'll give you time to go get it um, and get it maybe a notepad and a pen. But we're going to be in 1 Kings. It's a book in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at a story of some missed opportunities. Like last week we talked about our response. 
This week we're talking about our opportunities. How do we respond to our opportunities? And a little backstory of this passage is the nation of Israel under King Solomon. I don't know if you remember Solomon. He's David's son. And now he's reigning. And under King Solomon, Israel became the most powerful, one of the most powerful nations in the world at that time. And also one of the most wealthiest nations in the world. Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes over. But because of some bad policies and some invasive taxes, he loses half his country in five years. Like a the miniature civil war breaks out and the country splits into two. And Rehoboam finds himself only the king of the southern part of the kingdom, which takes on the name of Judah. It has Jerusalem in it. And the northern half of the kingdom takes on the name of Israel, keeps the name of Israel. Rehoboam is the king of Judah. A guy named Jeroboam becomes king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And God actually goes to Jeroboam and he says this, hey, listen, Jeroboam, what's happening is only temporary. Like, this is happening because I'm trying to bring my people back to me. I'm trying to bring some judgment. But listen, if you're just obedient, I'm going to bless your family. If you're just obedient, I'm going to bless you and your reign and, and, and all this. All you got to do is be obedient and be faithful. <clears throat> but Jeroboam didn't go that way. In fact, Jeroboam got really jealous of people leaving Israel and still going down to Jerusalem in the nation of Judah to go worship. And so to stop that, he, he built a worship place at the southern end of Israel and at the very northern tip of Israel. And he told him, look, you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. Let's make it really easy. You can just stop here and worship here. And I'm even going to make it easier than that. Like you don't have all the regulations and rules you used to have. So we, we're just going to worship this God named Baal, this false idol. And look, it's a lot easier. You can do whatever you want. And you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. And he started to turn the hearts of the people away from God. In fact, the Bible says he did evil in the sight of God. And from Jeroboam on, every king after him did worse and worse. Every one of them did more evil in the sight of God. Like it wasn't bad enough what Jeroboam did, so the next king would take it and like just multiply it. And what's really interesting is the next several kings of Israel, like one would become a king because he would assassinate the current king. And then what's crazy is then somebody would come and assassinate him a few years later or 1.7 days later, and then they would become king. And this cycle just kept repeating. And then when they were king, they did horrible, wicked things. For 60 years this went on. So we get to the point of our story where a guy named Ahab is king. Ahab is married to a woman named Jezebel. And the Bible says that Ahab did even more evil than everyone before him. Like, he was horrible. They took it so far as to say, hey, you know what? Not only can you worship in, in one of those two places, you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. But in fact, we're going to make it against the law to worship God. We're going to make it against the law for you to speak the name of Yahweh. Like, you can't worship him. You can't talk about him. And then they even took it a step further. We're going to find every preacher of God. We're going to find everybody who speaks God, who tries to, to tell people about God, and we're going to kill them. And so they started hunting down the prophets of God and killing them. It wasn't a pleasant time. On the scene here, though, here comes this guy named Elijah. And Elijah is a prophet of God, and he goes up to Ahab, and he says, hey, here's the deal. God told me to tell you this. It's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then he runs away. He leaves. So for the next three years, it doesn't rain in Israel. And Israel, whose economy is based on agricultural and livestock, it starts to tank. Times are bad. The, the harvest fails year after year. Livestock's dying because of lack of water. And Elijah told him, look, you're not gonna, you're, it's not going to rain. And so Ahab can't kill Elijah, right? Because if he kills Elijah, it's not going to rain. Because Elijah said it won't rain until I say so. But then Elijah goes back up to Ahab three years later in 1 Kings chapter 18. In verse 17, it says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, you destroyer of Israel? Ahab basically pins it all on Elijah. This is all your fault. And here's what Elijah responds in the next verse, in verse 18. He says, I have not destroyed Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have abandoned the Lord's commandments and followed the Baals or Balaam. Now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So here's what Elijah does. Elijah calls for a showdown. Elijah said, Ahab, it's time. Like we're going to settle this 
once and for all. Like this, it's, this is where it ends right here. He says, you get all your prophets or your priests of Baal, the false idol, and you have them meet me on Mount Carmel. And get all the other false priests of, of Asherah who eat with Jezebel. These would have been female priestesses um, who worship this, this idol uh, Asherah. You bring them all and meet me at Mount Carmel. And we're going to settle this. And so here, here's what happens. They, they meet on Mount Carmel. And Elijah tells the prophets of Baal, he says, you guys get your bull, your sacrifice. You build your altar. And I'll get my bull, my sacrifice, and I'll build my altar. And then we'll call to our God. And the God that answers by fire, that's the real God. We're just going to settle this. So the prophets of Baal, they get to go first, right? And they build their altar. They put their bull on it. And from morning to lunchtime, they're crying, they're praying, they're screaming out to Baal to send fire down from heaven and consume the altar and the sacrifice. What doesn't happen? So around lunchtime, Elijah starts to make fun of them. Like it's actually pretty funny if you read this passage in chapter 18. He starts to make fun. He's like, hey, look, maybe he's deaf and you got to talk louder. Maybe he's on a trip or a journey and you got to really scream, like really, really put your, your voice into it. Or maybe like he's just really busy or he's, maybe he's just thinking about it. Like he's totally like making fun of these guys and mocking them big time. And so from lunchtime to dinner time, now they start cutting themselves. And they start taking knives and start cutting. And so 450 guys are cutting themselves. The Bible says blood is everywhere. And at, at evening, in the evening, Elijah finally stops and says, okay, that's enough. <laughs> like, that's good. You guys had your turn, now it's my turn. So Elijah goes and he takes 12 stones and he rebuilds the altar of God that used to be on Mount Carmel. And he has them lay the bull on top of the altar. And then he digs this little trench around the altar. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get big, big tubs of water, big clay pots of water. I want you to pour it on top of the altar. So they go and they get this big clay pot of water and they dump it on top of the, of the altar. And it just soaks it. And Elijah says, go do it again. Then they do it again. And Elijah says, do it again. And they do it again. The Bible says they fill so much water on the the sacrifice, soaking wet. The wood, soaking wet. So much water on this place that it fills that little trench they dug around the altar. Then Elijah prays a prayer that lasts about 10 seconds. And the Bible says that fire came down from God, not only burned up the sacrifice, but it also destroyed the altar. And it licked up or dried up all the water that was around it in the trench. And then check, check out, here, here's what happens. Look in verse 39 of chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 39. It says, when all the people saw it, they fell down on their face and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Now, get what they just did. God sent fire from heaven in this huge display of power and majesty he answers Elijah's prayer. He sends the fire down. It destroys the altar, licks up all the water. Amazing sight. The people that are there that gathered from Israel fell on their face and cried out, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. They broke the law because something happened. right? And then Elijah tells him, he says, go and get all the false prophets. He tells those people who just fell on their face, go get the false prophets, take them down to the valley and kill them. Like, they're bad people. It's okay. Like, they, they've, they've earned this, all right? So they take him down and they kill him. Then Elijah tells Ahab, hey, guess what? It's going to rain. You need to get in your chariot and go back to Jezreel because your chariot's going to get stuck in the mud. It's going to rain. So Ahab gets in his chariot. He goes to Jezreel. Ahab takes off running towards Jezreel. Jezreel is where Jezebel's at right now. Ahab gets there and he goes in to tell Jezebel everything that just happened. And I don't know what, what he was expecting to take place. Like, I don't know, maybe he was tell him, hey, like, we got to change. Like, there's some things that aren't right. Like, you ain't going to believe what just happened. But he tells Jezebel everything that happened. And Jezebel sends a message to Elijah, who's in the same town. And the message goes like this. I heard what you did on Mount Carmel. You're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. I'm coming after you. Not the reaction that Elijah was expecting. Not really the response that he was prepared for. It's not something that he was thinking this was going to happen. Like, like there's this huge victory. This amazing thing happened where God shows up like in this big way. And now he has to run because assassins are after him. 
And what I want to do is I want to point out Elijah's response to this trouble now. His response to this trial and the opportunities that he missed. In chapter 19, verse 3, it says, Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. Not only did Elijah run for his life, but he ran all the way out of Israel and down into Judah to a place called Beersheba, where he would be safe. Abandoned every convert that just fell on their face before God on Mount Carmel, like left them out to dry. Remember, they just cried out, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God, broke the law. Ahab knows who was there. Jezebel's gonna find out who was there. And instead of going back to them and discipling them and helping them and leading them, Elijah takes off running down to Judah, to a place called Beersheba. He runs down to Beersheba. He lays down under a tree and he begs God just to take his life. Basically what Elijah says is, my, I'm worthless and I'm a failure. I failed. Like things got tough all of a sudden, so that must mean that I'm a failure. So God, you just need to take me out. Just take me out of the picture. Take me out of the equation because I just want to hide and die. So he's hiding in a place in, in a cave in a place called Mount Horeb. And God comes to him and God has this interaction with Elijah. And he asks them this question. And I love this question. In chapter 19, verse 9, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Not, not because God didn't know why Elijah was there. It's not that God was shocked that Elijah was there. In other words, what God is telling Elijah is, you're in the wrong place. By saying, what are you doing here, means that there was somewhere else that Elijah was supposed to be. By saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, you're in the wrong spot. <laughs> this is not where you're supposed to be. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. In the middle of this trial, in the middle of this storm, this cave on Mount Horeb is not where I want you. I love that about that question. Like, what are you doing here? This is not it. And here's Elijah's response. Look in verse 10. He replied, he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they are looking for me to take my life. Elijah says, God, I have been very jealous for you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, God, I'm a hard worker. <laughs> I've been faithful through all of this. Like I've been, I'm on your side. Like I've answered everything you've asked me to do. Like, don't you see this, God? In other words, what Elijah's really saying is, God, I don't deserve this. They're coming after me, this trial that I'm in, this storm that I'm enduring. I don't deserve it because I'm jealous for you, God. Like, I work for you. And then he kind of gets really spiritual. He kind of, he has, you know, he has to be a little spiritual because he's a preacher, you know. So he says, God, listen, look what they've done to you. God, they've abandoned you. God, they've torn down your places of worship. God, everyone has killed your messengers. God, everyone is after your messenger now. What Elijah's saying now is, God, where are you? Like, they're messing with you. Where are you? Why aren't you doing anything in the middle of all this? And then he finishes up by saying, I'm all alone. God, I've been faithful. I'm a hard worker. Look, they're messing with you, and you're not doing anything, and I am the only one left. So God gives Elijah this awesome object lesson. In verse 11 of chapter 19, it says, Then God said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. So, in other words, Elijah, get out of your cave. Go stand on the edge of the mountain and look over the valley. And here's what God does. At that moment, the Lord God passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering the cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So picture this in your mind. Elijah standing out on the side of this cliff looking over the valley, and God sends this huge storm. Storm, Think, think tornado. It's so severe that it says it's ripping them out. It's, it's uprooting trees. It's moving rocks around. It's this gigantic tornado type storm that's going through this. And Elijah was probably thinking, okay, this is it. God is showing up. But the Bible says God didn't speak to Elijah out of the tornado. So Elijah's probably standing there a little confused. 
And at that moment, an earthquake starts and he starts to feel the rumbling in his feet and he hears the pebbles start rolling down the mountainside and then the bigger boulders coming down. He's watching the trees move down the valley and he's thinking, okay, well, here it is. God just wanted to up his game a little bit, right? But the Bible says God didn't speak to Elijah out of the earthquake. So Elijah's waiting probably even more confused now than before. And when a firestorm rips through the valley and he's looking over and he's probably feeling the heat coming up from the valley and watching the sparks come up as the fire just ripped through, burning everything in its path. And Elijah probably thinking more than likely, hey, Mount Carmel, all right, we get to do it again. This is awesome. But the Bible says God didn't speak to him out of the fire. Each event, Elijah waiting for God to speak, thinking this is huge, this is powerful, surely God is in this, only to have each event pass and God silent. God was illustrating that Elijah had been looking for God in all the wrong places. He kept waiting for each trial and each storm to end like it did on Mount Carmel with this huge display of God's power and presence. Elijah was waiting for God to quote unquote show up. And God was showing Elijah that he was missing the point because Elijah was just looking for another miracle. But God did speak to Elijah, but not in those huge events. Look at the rest of that verse in verse 12, the end of it. And it says, after the fire, there was a voice, but not just any voice, it was a soft voice. Whisper. Some translations put it this way. It was a still, small voice. It wasn't loud and boisterous. It wasn't thundering through the canyon. It wasn't obvious and huge. It was a small whisper. And the softness, (laughs) don't equate softness with not being powerful. Because even though it was a whisper, a still, small whisper, it sent Elijah running back towards the cave, covering his face up. Because the whisper was where the power was at. God's very word. The softness, it must have been very powerful, and it got its point across. Elijah runs back to the cave, And God comes back to Elijah and once again asks him the question, Elijah, why are you here? In other words, Elijah, this is still not the place you're supposed to be. You're in the wrong location looking for the wrong thing. And Elijah just repeated the same rehearsed line that he said earlier. I'm all alone. I've been jealous for you. They're they're coming after you. They're slandering you, God. They're, They're killing your prophets. They're tearing down your altars. So then God reveals to Elijah some of the missed opportunities. In verse 15 and 16 of chapter 19, God gives Elijah some marching orders. Look, you got to anoint this guy to be king here. You need to go over here and anoint this guy to be king over this place. You need to go find this guy named Elisha, and you're going to anoint him to take your place one day. Like, there's still a job for you to do. In the middle of the trial, in the middle of the storm, there's still something for you to do. I still have a job. It hasn't stopped. And then he tells him about this missed opportunity. Look in verse 18. He says, but I have left 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Not only was there work that still needed to be done, but most importantly, there was an opportunity that was missed. That while Elijah, when he got the word from Jezebel, and Jezreel, and took off running for his life back to Judah, what God is telling him, look, you have abandoned some people who need you. Not only the people on Mount Carmel that day that gave their life to God, but the people that lived in Israel. And for over 60 years, there were 7,000 of them that never bowed down to Baal, that never kissed the statue, that never gave in. They held the line, and they were needing and waiting on a leader and some encouragement and somebody to come in and bring them back to what God had for them. And God said, Elijah, if you missed that, you're not alone. You abandoned these people. God has a remnant left there, 7,000 people. 
who endured 60 years of trials and storms and giants being hunted and persecuted. But Elijah was so focused on his trial and on his storm that he missed that opportunity. So what about for us? Like, how, What's the application for us? Like in that moment, it got really difficult for Elijah. We don't want to minimize the storm. Like it's probably really tough having an assassin after you. Like I get that. It's probably really tough feeling like you're all alone. It's really tough to not really know what it is that God wants for you. I get that. That's kind of where we're at right now, right? Everything's different. Did things just get tougher? Yes. But honestly, in some ways, things got a little easier. Will, things, will there be more things that change? Probably. Will things be different after this is over? More than likely. But did our job change? Morning start, listen to me. Lean in right now. Whether you're watching from home or in a house church, you got to get this. Did our job change? Absolutely not. Because the degree of difficulty does not determine our calling. Whatever we're facing in this life, the degree of how difficult it is does not get to determine our calling. God did not take away our mandate. God did not take away our mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ who was born, who lived, who was crucified, who was buried, who rose again. And for anybody who puts our faith and trust in Jesus Christ will have eternal life with God forever in heaven. That didn't change. I think we got a little comfortable, a little too complacent, and now God has stirred up his church, and he is stretching us. But at the same time, he's providing opportunities that we've never had before. And my fear is we're going to miss it. God is in control. Are we up for the challenge? So I want to finish with this. There's three things we've got to do based on Elijah's passage here, the story of where he's at, so we don't miss opportunities. And the first one is this. Stop waiting for God to quote unquote show up. Stop waiting for God to show up. See, Elijah didn't need another miracle. He wanted another miracle, but he didn't need another miracle. Elijah needed his eyes open to the opportunities that were already around him. He was waiting for God to quote unquote show up big. And God said, no, I'm already with you. Church, listen to me. We don't need to sit around and wait for God to show up because Jesus Christ lives in us as believers. He's already here. He's just waiting for us to realize and open our eyes to the opportunities that he already has for us to all around us every day. Elijah wanted every trial and every problem to end up like Mount Carmel. And he was expecting God to be in the storm, in the earthquake, in the fire. But God was in that still, small voice. The, sta- the same still small voice that talks to our heart, not audibly, but that moves and prompts us, the Holy Spirit in us. So stop waiting for God to show up. Number two, stop listening to people who say you can't. Stop listening to people who are a source of discouragement, who are a source of a Jezebel spirit in your life. Jezebel and Ahab, stop talking about God, they said. Stop praying to God. Stop worshiping God. Don't even mention God's name. And by the way, we're coming after you. Stop listening to people who say you can't. There's always going to be somebody who says, that ain't going to work. There's always going to be somebody who's going to discourage God's work in your life. Wherever there's someone building a wall like Nehemiah, there's going to be somebody like a Sambalat and Tobiah saying you can't do it. We got to stop listening to people who are negative sources in our life saying we can't do things for God. Elijah focused so much on Ahab and Jezebel, he missed the 7,000 who were waiting. And he missed the ones who had answered the call for revival at Mount Carmel. Number one, stop waiting for God to show up. Number two, stop listening to people who say you can't. Number three, stop listening to yourself. Stop listening to to yourself. For Elijah, it was all about himself. He had convinced himself that he was all alone. He had convinced himself that no one else loved God. He would convince himself that, there, that he was worthless and a failure. He, Jezebel was a source of discouragement for him, but Elijah was a source of discouragement for himself too. He had convinced himself, I can't do this. I can't keep going. 
I can't minister. I can't love. I can't reach out anymore. And when he listened to himself, he missed the opportunities in the trial. When he listened to God's still small voice, his eyes were open to the opportunities. Church, we got to stop waiting for God to show up. We got to stop listening to the negativity and the people who say we can't do it. We got to stop listening to ourselves. We got to start listening for that voice of God, that moving in our heart. Stop waiting for the earthquake and the firestorm and the tornado to come through and be like, oh, there's God. And understand God is in us. And all the power that Jesus had in the resurrection is in us. It's living in us. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there's so many opportunities right now that God, even in the middle of this trial and this trouble in our nation right now, economically and health-wise, everything in between, that God is creating these opportunities for us as the church to step up and to step out. Stop waiting for God to show up and we need to step up. What are the opportunities we're missing? So my challenge today as we close out, whether you're at your home or you're at a house church or you're watching from somewhere else, our prayer today is that we evaluate, God, what am I missing? What opportunities am I missing? Because I'm focused on me. What opportunities am I missing to show the love of Christ because I'm listening to people who say I can't? What opportunities am I missing to reach my neighbor or my loved one with the gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm waiting for God to show up? What are those barriers? And let's move them. And let's change this world for Jesus Christ. Virus or no virus, our job hasn't changed. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your word this morning that, man, it's so, it's so applicable to our lives. Right now where we're at, in the middle of this storm in our country, in the middle of this storm in our world right now, it's so easy to get focused on us. But God, there are so many opportunities that you are, you're creating every day for all of us to say something, to do something, to reach out. But God, we've got to stop waiting for the big miracle and just understand you're already in us. We've got to stop listening to those who are going to be negative and tell us we can't share our faith. We can't reach out. We've got to stop listening to ourselves, the seeds of doubt, that we're worthless, that we're a failure, that we're all alone. And rest in your power and your strength to go out and preach the gospel. Because God, the, the difficulty we're in right now doesn't change the calling that you've put on our lives. God, I pray for those that are listening and watching right now. Open our eyes. For those that have maybe never given their life to you, God, we pray that they'll today even put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.